Well, church, good morning again. It's good to see you. This morning, I would like to share a message from way back in Genesis. It's the story of Jacob. Jacob and Esau were twins. And somehow, Esau was a little lax and... Jacob's mother decided that she wanted Jacob to receive the blessing. Esau was the one that came out first. There were twins, but the one that entered the world first would receive the blessing. But the mother didn't want that because Esau was a hunter and he was a carefree man and he was enjoying life and he wasn't taking things too seriously. So first, he lost his birthright over a plate of food. And then his mother concocted a plan for her son Jacob, whom she loved more than Esau, to get the blessing from his father. The legacy was passed on through Jacob because the blessing produces a legacy. And this morning's story is taken from, from Genesis chapter 32. And we're going to begin at verse 24. So here is Jacob. He had to run away from his brother because his brother seemed to have been a more aggressive person and stronger maybe, but he had to run away. And so his mother sent him to her uncle, Uncle Laban, or her brother, sorry, would be Jacob's Uncle Laban. And there he, on the way there, he, he stopped in a place called Bethel, the house of God. He gave it the name Bethel because as he slept, he saw the angels ascending and descending. And in short, he had an encounter with the divinity of God in a dream, in a vision. And he got up and he set up a stone and he poured oil on it and he made a covenant that he would pay a tenth of whatever he owns to God. Tithing began. moved on to his uncle Laban. And his uncle Laban was just as much a schemer as his sister, Jacob's mother. So he had Jacob work and work and work. And he would defraud him by changing the, the, the agreement because Jacob was very prosperous because the blessings of God was on him and the prosperity flowed out of him. Jealousy is a peculiar animal. It thinks nothing of the cost to the other person. And so Laban became jealous of Jacob, his nephew. And Jacob was greatly in love with... I forget the daughter's name now. Um... um Rachel, and he worked for seven years just to earn the privilege of marrying Rachel. But Laban, the schemer, sent in Leah. And once the marriage was consummated, it was a, a done deal. So Jacob said, you know what, I'll work another seven years for Rachel because he loved Rachel. And he worked another seven years, and he got Rachel. But then the, the, the scheming went on until the, the flocks that were multiplying and belonging to Jacob was, was changed, and Jacob came up with a plan, and they, they knocked it in, and Jacob eventually earned sufficient. He says, you know what? It's time for me to go home. And there was a little stopover 
We're able to track them down because some, some images and some idols were missing. And then they made a new covenant that they won't pass this point. So now Jacob was a point of no return. Have you ever got to that place in your life where you're at a point of no return? It seemed like there's just no going back. It's, it's, it's finished. There's, there's nothing there. There's, there's, there's a complete block. Many of us have met those roadblocks in our lives. And yet, the way forward is scary. It's, it's difficult because you know what's ahead of you is, is it's trouble waiting and you must go. So he comes to the Jabok, a little brook, and he must cross the brook. And once he crosses the brook, he's back in the land of promise. He's back in Esau's territory. But yet he has the birthright to the territory. But he has this fear of his brother Esau. So he makes a plan and he sends the children forward. And the children go in with the wives and all the rest and the, the servants and everything else. And he, he, he lingers. He lingers on this side of the Jabbok. The story of Jacob is a story of challenge. The deceiver who ran away but has a vision from God continues his journey in running away. The deceiver who deceived his father is now deceived by his uncle. The deceiver must return home because the relationship with his uncle has come to an end, an impasse. He must go home to face the angry brother. And many of us, if we find a, form a picture of it, you'll see it, it, it. Sometimes we have to face an angry brother. We have to face an angry situation. But let's read a little bit from the story and let's see if we could get a few thoughts that can carry us through life a little bit further on. Beginning at verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that the man did not prevail against him, he touched he, the divine Christophanes, saw that Jacob could not prevail against him and he could not free himself of Jacob. The divine Christophanes touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the Christophanes, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Underscore that. I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he, the Christophanes, said to Jacob, what is your name? You think he didn't know his name already? But he wanted Jacob to come to his senses. He says, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he, the Christophanes, said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. 
Then Jacob asked, saying, Please tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob called the name of the place Penel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Father, this morning, help us to glean from these words substance that will keep us focused and persevering in Jesus' name. I have entitled the message this morning, A Prayer and Pinel. A prayer and pinel. You see, the story demonstrates to us that there are many challenges that we will face in life. Jacob was facing a challenge of fear and confusion and doubt. He had no idea how his brother would respond to him. But he was afraid of his brother because he knew his guilt. He knew he had cheated his brother Esau. And he was not deserving of anything better. And in it we can see sometimes we are guilty. Maybe of something we said or something we did. And our conscience comes to life and we are afraid of facing that person or meeting up with that person. We, we rather avoid them. We, we will find a way around that situation and survive as best we could. But it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Noah, in the Bible, face the flood and there was nothing he could do about the flood it wouldn't go away it was God's plan to destroy all the wickedness on the earth and clean it up but he left a root he left a twig he left a survivor so that mankind can continue on. And yet we see in Noah the vein of sinfulness showing up. He gets drunk. He gets drunk. And laying on the floor. It creates a problem. that brings division in his own family. One son looks at the nakedness, and so he is removed because his violation of his father. And the two other sons covers him up. But the vein of sinfulness is now planted among men. Abraham. Abraham from the Ur of Chaldees, God calls him to, to, to establish a new way. God wants to work through this man. And he tells him, leave everything and Go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham seems to be obeying God, but he does two things. First, he takes his father with him because I guess he was concerned about who will care for his aging father. And he had to go to Haran and wait there until the father died before he could continue his journey. But he also slipped in his nephew Lot. You know, he must have loved his nephew Lot and figured, well, it's good to take him along. You know, the young man will get a, a chance to be part of what God wants to do. And sometimes we have that bond with 
relatives who try to take them along, but it's in disobedience to God. When I became a Christian, I learned one thing because I didn't want to let go of friends either. And I used to search them out. And they, many of them make verbal commitments to be Christians also, but they live the lifestyles that they... There was no change. There was, no, there, was no, there was nothing, no depth to this commitment that they made. It was an audible commitment. It was not a soul commitment. So I had to let them go. For me to move on with the Lord, I had to leave behind everything that didn't belong, including my business, the friends, the lifestyles. It all had to go. But Abraham held on. And he had to give it up. And he ended up lying goes down to Egypt. He goes back to the way of the world to see, because the famine was great. And instead of trusting God, he goes to man's provision and he had to lie his way through it. You know the story very well. But God calls Abraham his friend. We have these obstacles. We, just like Jacob, there's so many examples of them. There was Joseph, his brothers sold him. And yet his brothers were reconciled to him because God's plans must be completed. He's an unfailing God. And so the many challenges we would face, we must understand he's an unchanging God. And it brings me to the very place of what Christmas is all about because we, we are celebrating the birth of the unchanging God incarnate. God veiled himself in humanity and he came as a man so we could relate better to him. That's the love of God. That's how much God loves us. And, and, and he puts aside all these obstacles and sinfulness. But he'll only put it aside as the story goes on, as you'll see later. There are many experiences that must shape our lives. I remember Bishop King at the dedication, he was talking about a little nut, cola nut, or some nut, I can't remember which one. When it's green, you could take a hammer and hammer it, and it doesn't break. But when it's allowed to ripe and dry and get ready, when it's, when it's ready for eating, she smacks right open. And he talked about that as an illustration to the process that God takes us through to mature us for readiness. Readiness to spend eternity with him. And friends, God's not done until he's done. We will have these little challenges and these little situations and we'll continue to have them until we reach to the point where he's ready for us and he says, my child, come. And then there's nothing more we can do but to go. Quite a few years ago, there was a lady in the hospital. Her family were all Christian, surrounding her. Her daughter was the wife of a pastor, a very recognized pastor in Grenada. And I remember visiting her, and she said to me, on the third visit or somewhere like that, she said to me, Pastor Banfield, I want you to talk to my family for me. I says, what about? What's the problem? She said, they would not let me go. They're holding on to me and they're praying that I could stay. And I want to go. The psalmist in 133 says that he will satisfy us with long life. 
we who are putting our confidence in him, we who have these many experiences that will shape our lives, he will satisfy us. Think of Job in the uh, story of Job. What a horrible experience that a man could have. His wife even says, Job, curse God and die. Get out of your misery. Job says no. But he still didn't have his theology right. Until God showed up in the whirlwind and then he asked him a few questions. He says, Job, do you know who makes the rain stay in the sky? And Job, do you know who does this and who does that? And, and, and Job says, I, am, I, I put my hand on my mouth. I can't speak. A good lesson for us. Sometimes we have a, an answer for everything. And sometimes we think we know the Bible inside out, but do we know what the Bible is saying? Before we start to speak and as though we speak in the oracles of God. Do we really know what it is saying? When God showed up, he restored Job with more than he ever had before. There was no loss, but Job had to encounter God. He had to encounter God to be able to be restored. We have to have this encounter with God. But here is the prayer. Here is the prayer that can change every life. I will not let you go unless you bless me. When have we got to the place where we put the struggles before us aside and we understand all the challenges of life that we must face and the experiences that we are not even aware of, the uncharted territory, when we put it all aside and we find a place, a pinel, a place where we will meet with God and we will not let Him go, we will hold on to God and say, God, until you bless me. The schema had to find that place. All the scheming days were over. And I think it's a lesson for every one of us as we face this Christmas season. We know that Jesus is not born on the 25th of December. He was born at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, which are long gone. We know that. Because you could trace it back. And that's another story. I won't get into it. But this date was set, and so we celebrate on this date, just like the Queen of England has a birthday. Many of us don't know the date, but the 24th of May was the day we were celebrating her birthday. So we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And therefore we need to understand that if we celebrate in the birth of Jesus, the question is, do we know him? Or are we going to celebrate traditions? Some people won't celebrate at all because they say it's not really the day he was born. And they don't have any day so they don't celebrate his birth at all. But I think there's great need to celebrate the birth of Jesus, but there is a greater need to find a pinel. A place where we can stay in prayer and hold on to Jesus until we know that he, he, He's going to bless us if we would only wait. The old Pentecostals, when the movement first began, they called it tarrying at the altar. And sometimes they would tarry all night. Because they were waiting on what? They were waiting on the blessing. The, the second outpouring of God's grace. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. The glossolalia, the language and tongues that 
becomes a prayer language that the enemy does not know. So when we pray in that language, we're praying directly with God and we're communicating in a different level that Satan and all his cohorts, they, they, they have to shut up because they can't hear us. And some people call it weird babbling. But it's not weird babbling when you receive it. It's a deeper understanding. And Jude, the brother of Jesus, said, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. And Paul wrote about it in Romans chapter 8. He said, the Spirit, it intercedes on our behalf with groanings and utterances that we cannot comprehend. You can read it yourself, Romans 8. But we need that pinel. And it's not going to happen with a five-minute walk and talk. Jacob spent the night in fear and trepidation. But finally, when the Christophanies, when the presence of God in human form showed up that he could relate to God, he couldn't relate to the Spirit God as he should, even though he had a vision and even though he saw the angels, but now he has a confrontation with God and he realizes that this is a deity. This is something supernatural. I'm not letting you go until you, the supernatural, empower me with your blessing. I have my father's blessing, so I know what that's worth. But I don't want to let you go. I mean, I'm not letting you go. I'll never let you go. Hold on to Jesus. And this is the time to do it because we're celebrating his birth. It's not how much food we eat and how many gifts we give, but it's how willing are we to present ourselves to the most holy God and wait upon him so that all these challenges and all these confusions and all this scheming and all the nonsense that's in our lives can be Broken! Jacob did it. He had to limp for the rest of his life. There's two things. There's a noticeable mark when you have that experience. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes again. It doesn't mean that you won't be human anymore. But there's a noticeable mark on your life. People ask you, something happened to you. I see a change. Or they might watch you for a few months to see if the change is real. My lovely wife could attest to that. There were several people that says, I wanted to see if it was real. Adrian, I see a change in you, but I wanted to, I, I, I didn't say anything because I wanted to wait and see if it's real. And I'm confessing to you today that I still make a lot of mistakes. But that change carries me in the deepest moments of my life. Sometimes you feel like you have no strength in your body anymore because but you have to go on. The burden is so great. The sorrow is so heavy. But he gives you the power to take one step at a time and to carry on and carry on and carry on and carry on. You'll face those brothers You'll be able to challenge the people along the way. You'll be able to start a new life. 
you'll be able to build and take others along with you. I'm not talking about building buildings with mortar and cement. I'm talking about building character. There's a time that every life can be changed. There's a time, my friends, whether you know it or not, we're on the threshold of that hour when there has to be changed, whether you like it or not. I would suggest it's better that we pursue the change voluntarily because the prophet Jeremiah tells us I'll read it for you from Jeremiah 30 beginning at verse 5 for thus saith the Lord who's speaking Jeremiah the prophet is saying that this is what God wants me to say for him Thus saith the Lord. We have heard a voice trembling of fear and of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? And all the faces turn pale. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. He takes us right back to the brook Jabbok. The time of Jacob's trouble, he doesn't know which way to go, which way to turn. And the prophet is saying that there's a time coming, and I believe that time is upon us. I see the signs. Tornadoes in winter tearing up from one state to the other. The Russian army is standing outside of Trebanka, or wherever it is, the Ukrainian country, wanting to take it back and bring it back into some kind of union. The armies of America came out of I forget the name of the place now, but they just removed them. You'll come to me in a minute. But the borders cannot be controlled. The Syrian people are fleeing for their lives if they could get away. Wars and rumors of wars. The plagues are being poured out every time there's a new COVID variant. Every time we think, ooh, it's lifting, it's getting better. Variant, variant. Worse than the other one. Worse than the first one. I ask you, could this be the time that he's talking about because if it is, Jacob's troubles at Jabbok, he left a pinel, a place where he met with God. And we need to find a pinel, a place where we'll meet with God. Because the troubles 
that are on the horizon will never end. Another one will come, and another one will come, and another one will come, and another one will come. How long? I don't know. For how many more years? God alone knows. But here's what Jesus said. Be prepared. Because Paul wrote, that the children of light will not be in darkness and these times will overcome the children of darkness and we who are in the light must walk as children in the light and that's why I, I, I plead with us today for us to find a pinel a place where we meet with God and don't let go don't let go until God blesses you he blesses you and empowers you to be able to face the storms of life and the schemas and the challenges that are all around us. And if you don't understand it, go into the business world and ask some questions. Cost of living is escalating out of control. We don't know why. A businessman who is qualified to speak told me that China took 12... Not 12... 1,800 ships and just sent them for scrap iron so that these giant ships, container ships, they can control the shipping. And what do you think happens? Prices of shipping are doubling. All where you turn, schemas are trying to line their pockets with money to die and leave it. But the church of Jesus Christ, we who are blessed of the Lord, we will never lack if we truly follow the word and obey it. God will take care of his own. Did he not say this? I will never leave you nor forsake you to the end of the earth. We need to find a pinel this holiday season and celebrate a time for the blessing. The blessing. We must get it. We must receive it. Or we will remain helpless in the times of scheming and trickery. We must be overcomers. And you know what he says in Revelation 21 verse 8? The timid. Timid. Are the first that will not enter the kingdom of God. They'll be grouped with all the schemers and liars and murderers and whoremongers and they'll be grouped with that group. So my question is, as we close, what will it take? As we celebrate these festive seasons, let us remember that whatever we will face, we must not let go of the blesser until he blesses us. There's no point in going through this life just to work and dead. And that's exactly what will happen if we do not know the Lord. And we will not know the Lord We'll know about him, but we will not know him unless we have a pinel, a place we meet with him. It's a life-changing experience. It changed Jacob's life, and he says, you're no longer Jacob, you're Israel, because 
You fought with man and God. What new name would you have? Because you won't get it unless you have a Pinel. So there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. It's mine. Can you really, honestly, say those words with confidence? There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. Thank God it's mine. Would you stand with us, please?